think we had a very uh, important session this morning, really historic to General Electric uh, workers talking about the reality of <coughs> power. Uh, so in, in the Bay Area, uh, it's not only in nuclear power stations, but the issue of whistleblowers' contamination and our health and safety of the workers and the communities is, uh, is an issue for people in the Bay Area, including the uh, Livermore uh, Radioactive Laboratories. And Scott Young is, a, uh, is the uh, council and uh, has been active in supporting the, the workers and the community to protect them and they're bound for uh, proper health and care, uh, health and care, and also uh, to protect the community. So I'm happy to, that he's able to come here this afternoon. Welcome, Scott. Oh, thanks for having me, Steve. I really appreciate it. Nice to see you. People in the audience is longtime Livermore activists as well. So nice to see you guys. Um, I just wanted to share one thought about that amazing video. And thanks so much for working on that. It's really impressive. Uh, my wife was actually pregnant when Fukushima happened, and our child was born two months later. And I worry about him all the time. So just to imagine what the mothers in Fukushima must be going through is just really heavy. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much for capturing that, Steve. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you guys. You know, it's, we're kind of changing gears now from the nuclear power issues and whistleblowers to nuclear weapons. Um, Livermore Lab is a nuclear weapons lab. 88% uh, of the budget there is still devoted to nuclear weapons activities today. Um, so that's about a billion dollars a year there goes to nuclear weapons activities. They still have radioactive material on site, um, although less than they used to. Um, but I think what goes kind of unacknowledged is the um, major impact the work there has had on the workers. Um, you know, it's had a big impact on the community, and we uh, kind of use that a lot and, and refer to that a lot. We don't really refer to the workers as much. So I'm going to talk to you guys mainly about the workers today. Uh, but in case you aren't very familiar with Livermore Lab, I'll talk a little bit about the lab itself and its history. Um, I'll talk about a program that the government has set up to uh, uh, compensate the workers and I'll talk about whistleblowing in the nuclear weapons complex more generally, and I'll just share some stories that I have from workers that I think you might think are interesting. So Livermore Lab was set up in 1953, or opened in 1953, as one of our two nuclear weapons labs, the other being Los Alamos, which uh, developed the bombs for that bomb, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When it opened, um, they were opening it really to compete with the weapons programs at Los Alamos in order to push forward more advanced nuclear weapons in hope of thermonuclear weapons, which is the hydrogen bomb that was largely developed at Livermore Lab. Um, and the saying at the site back in those days was, the Soviet Union is the adversary and Los Alamos is the enemy. <laughs> um, there was really this culture of competition. Um, it's also always been a kind of academic culture, or they tried to create an academic culture, our nuclear weapons are not developed by the military. They're developed under the Department of Energy. And this was an intentional move to have it be a civilian, quote unquote, agency that did our nuclear weapons work. And um, the, the University of California has been largely entwined with that work as the manager of both Los Alamos and Anna Livermore although that relationship recently changed in 2005 in our um, government's push to privatize everything. They have privatized management at um, almost all of our nuclear weapons facilities and at both Los Alamos and Livermore. Uni the University of California is still involved, but they're one of five uh, private entities that, are, that form a consortium that's called Lawrence Livermore National <laughs> Security LLC. <laughs> Um, so this has changed things for the workers. They're no longer managed by the University of California. They're now managed by a private company that uh, it includes Google, <coughs> University of California, um, Battelle Corporation, Babcock and Wilcox, which is a very large weapons contractor. And it's changed the culture away from academia to more of a profit-driven corporate culture, um, which 
you know, has ha kind of has two effects that we can talk about that more in questions if you want to. Um, but the culture at the lab is also one of secrecy. Um, it was highly classified, and still is highly classified for the most part. Um, most of the workers who work there, especially in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, wouldn't even talk to their own families about what they were working on there. Um, I run it, have lots of situations where the worker has died and I'm helping the spouse of the worker try to get compensation and acknowledgement. And the spouse has no idea what, where he worked on site or where she worked on site in some instances um, or what they were working on. Um, and so this creates a lot of problems in trying to prove causation for the illness um, if we're getting to that point. Um, there's also a big major culture of denial. Um, there's almost, there's some posters that the Department of Energy had about safety in the workplace that are almost humorous, showing you know, smiling cartoon characters and nuclear material behind them. And, um, it, was, it was almost a joke that they thought this material was, was dangerous. They, um, the culture there was one of laxity and denial that these workers were in danger. Um, and some of the workers, especially in more modern times, are working in buildings that have had many different operations going on in the buildings over time. Buildings that used to have much more hazardous material in them now have offices in them. Um, and so this is a kind of another way that the culture there denies what's happened in the past and that it um, can have an impact in the future. People working in offices now are coming down with bizarre illnesses related to things like beryllium. Um, which is a highly toxic metal, even though they've never worked with beryllium, just because the building they're working in is contaminated. Um, so, let's see what else do I want to say about that. Um, so working with the workers in, in 2000, Tri-Valley Cares, where I work, I should say more about Tri-Valley Cares mm -hmm. as well. Tri-Valley Cares was started in 1983 by concerned citizens who were living around Florence Livermore National Lab. Um, there were some very large protests out at the lab at that time, um, and it was kind of a wake-up call for the local community um, uh, who were taking notice both of the fact that this highly secure, highly classified nuclear weapons facility was in their backyard and maybe they should um, check out what was happening there, and to the fact that this work could have a very big impact on the environment and the community, on the health of people in the community, and there were a whole bunch of sick workers by that time already who um, people were starting to notice uh, you know, folks walking around in the community who were very ill. Um, so Tri-Valley Cares was created, and it's kind of an interesting group because we're not just made up of um, kind of the anti-nuke folks in the community, but also a lot of workers are members of our organization because they see us as the, the outside vehicle for uh, whistleblowing, basically, for ensuring that if there are safety and health issues that aren't being taken care of internally at the lab, they have a group outside that they can go to to help them communicate with media, and we have an attorney on staff who is me, and I can help them navigate whistleblower laws and you know, give them guidance about how they should go about blowing the whistle and potentially bringing litigation against the lab um, to get reinstated or whatever it is they want. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the statutory protections that whistleblowers in the nuclear weapons complex have, um, and so we can get into that too. But um, I wanted to talk more about our relationship with workers because um, in 1990, in the 90s, uh, more workers started talking to us about the troubles they were having getting any sort of acknowledgement or compensation from the lab or the Department of Energy. And, there was a, there's other groups like Tri-Valley Cares. In fact, there's 36 organizations around the country um, located in nuclear weapons towns, um, where, like Los Alamos and Hanford and Washington, and um, the list goes on and on. There's many sites where there's affected workers and affected communities. Um, so we, as organizations, got together, helped these workers who were also helping themselves to create a legislation um, to create a program that would help them get compensation. It's called the Energy Employee Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. The uh, acronym is EOICBA. Um, EOICBA made it so that these workers, or it, it's a Department of Labor run program that made it so that there was another agency besides just the Department of Energy 
who would look into these worker claims, um, get documents from the Department of Energy, uh, mostly exposure records. Every employee at the lab every day wears a dosimeter, which is a badge that measures some of the dose that they receive. It doesn't measure all kinds of radiation, but um, it's kind of all they have. And so they get those records and <clears throat> will assist the claimant to an extent, build a case to get compensation. And they can get up to $250,000, or their survivors can, um, for their illnesses on the job. And um, it's a, it does have causation requirements that are generally burdensome on the claimant and hard for them to prove, so sometimes we help with that. But more importantly, we created a support group for sick workers in the community so that they can get together in Livermore and, and talk about um, both their work histories and the, um, the, this program. Now, when I first took this job and started learning about it, my kind of visceral reaction to Tri-Valley Cares having this group was, truthfully, do we really want to help nuclear workers? I mean, didn't they kind of know what they were getting into? And do I really feel that bad for them doing this work? Um, and it, it was something to grapple with, and it is something that we still should grapple with. But it actually has some real benefit to the organization. Um, that make, makes it worth it. And I've gotten to know many of these workers, and I, don't, I do feel like they deserve the help. For one thing, many of them, um, like I say, didn't have much idea about what they were working on, or are things like janitors and cafeteria workers who would go and you know, clean up and or deliver meals in highly radioactive facilities at the lab without protections. So those people I definitely feel like merit help. Um, and even other workers, I'm willing to help because it does create the ability for Tri-Valley Cares to have people on the inside who trust us at the lab, and having that is, is really important to our work. Um, it enables us to work much more copacetically with the lab and on lots of aspects. It gives us um, the ability to build relationships with these workers and the union, um, and you know these people are part of the community in Livermore, and 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 so it, it is beneficial work. But I'm happy to talk more about that kind of duality if you guys want to. So um, just some numbers. Eoikpa is for the whole complex, and so far 95,000 workers who've worked on nuclear weapons programs have applied for benefits. I would say 99% of those workers have very legitimate claims. Um, not only about half of their claims get approved, but that's just because of the burdens of causation in the act that are very difficult. Um, people don't go through the effort of applying for benefits unless they have a serious illness that they truly believe is caused by um, some contamination of it. So I'll just give an example. I have one worker who <coughs> was um, in some of the wall windows that protect them from the vaults where there's radioactive material, there's actually liquid that's made up of different things that you know, keeps the radiation from permeating out into the room. They have to empty that liquid and clean that and then put liquid back in. Well, he received a chemical splash doing that across his chest um, that at the time burnt his skin away. And it was a documented incident. He went to medical at the lab and they um, you know, help them out and he took some time off and we eventually went back to work. It wasn't the biggest deal ever, but a fairly serious thing. Well, 15 years down the road, he got melanoma all the way across those scars. That was quite severe on his chest. Um, this was clearly a worker caught in a, a, on the job related illness. However, they were trying to not give him compensation. <coughs> um, so it took some real help from from us, we did an oral hearing where he actually took his shirt off and said, look, you can see, it's shaped like the splash that I got. It's where my scars were. He had pictures of his scars. And it, and it took that level of showing the Department of Labor what had happened to get him compensation. Um, but he did get compensation. And another story I wanted to tell about how this working with the workers not only gives us you know, cre credit with them, but it helps our work in understanding the kind of impacts it's had on the community. Um, this story is I, is hearsay. It's a third party story, so it's not something that I can confirm. Although truthfully, I do believe the veracity of the story. 
a gentleman whose father was the director of the plutonium facility at the lab, so the facility where they keep all of the plutonium, um, which is the most highly radioactive substance known to man. Um, uh, had, there's usually, we're usually around 100 employees there. Um, his father was the, worked in the facility, and then later on he did. And this is the son talking to me. He had had ex extreme exposure to mercury on the job at the lab, but he was just sharing a story with me because we had built this relationship. There's a park in Plutonium that people call, or in Livermore, that people call Plutonium Park. And it's a park where back in the early 90s, when uh, Livermore was listed on the Superfund site of the most contaminated city or places in the country. The Environmental Protection Agency had to come to town to take um, samples of dirt to create to establish background radiation levels, so that then they could test and find where there were higher levels of radiation. And they went to a city park, a good place to collect a background sample, and took samples. Um, it's called Big Trees Park. In reality, it's not actually called Plutonium Park. Um, they took samples in Big Trees Park, and they were extremely high for the for plutonium content, especially in one area at the park. Um, so even though they were just trying to get a background sample, it kind of set some alarms off. They came and resampled and found the similarly high levels of plutonium. They were just below the mandatory cleanup. They almost had to make the park another super fun site. But it wasn't high enough for that. Instead, all the lab had to do was go and remove the top two inches or so of topsoil, replant grass, and call it a day kind of thing. But it's always been a little bit of a mystery how that plutonium showed up in the park. The park's about three quarters of a mile from site, from the main site in Livermore, although it is an, there's an arroyo that comes down, a, a dry creek bed that's wet some parts of the year. But, um, so, you know, there were some thoughts, maybe plutonium got in the arroyo, but how did it get up on the field and near where those trees were? So this gentleman, um, when we were in kind of a casual conversation, said, you know, I know why there's plutonium in that park. I said, well, why? He said, well, my dad was the director of the plutonium facility, and every once in a while, um, he felt like the guys needed a break. It was about 100% it was 100 men who worked in the plutonium facility during those times, in the 60s and 70s. So, yeah, he uh, would take the guys to the park at lunch for a break. And they would eat lunch, and they couldn't have alcohol on site, but if they went to the park for lunch, they could drink beer. And, you know, the guys would love that. So he would take them to the park, and they drank beer, and there's no bathrooms at the park. So what do guys do when they drink beer? Well, they would all pee on the eucalyptus trees, where the highest levels of plutonium were found around those eucalyptus trees. So plutonium is highly mobile through the body, which is a good thing. Um, but these guys who were around plutonium, even in their suits during the day, would take a break, go to the park, pee on the trees, and deposit plutonium. And that makes sense for another reason, and that is that they have found um, in uh, sludge, which is kind of the leftover dirt that the uh, city tr uh, sewer has, the treatment plant, um, they found that the sludge that the treatment plant was giving back to city residents for gar as garden amendment was also contaminated with plutonium. And that's because those same workers were using the being in the toilets at the, at the office and it was going to the city sewer treatment plant, which had no way to treat that. So it would just go directly into the sludge. Um, they stopped that practice and had to do some major cleanup all across town for people who knew they had taken sludge. For people who didn't know about it, there's still potentially plutonium spread all over town just from taking that sludge. Um, but my point was that this worker shared a very valuable story with me, so it's a valuable program that we have to work with those workers. Um, and it's uh, a shocking story as well. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about whistleblowing in the nuclear weapons complex and the history of that at Livermore. Most of our high-profile high whistleblowers have actually blown the whistle about employment issues, mainly discrimination against women, discrimination against Asian Americans. Um, those are the two biggest lawsuits. But we have had people blow the whistle about construction projects that were um, being completed not according to the original design. And, and that's becoming a bigger issue in the nuclear weapons complex now, and one that we should all be kind of aware about. I, I, the specific example I want to give is something called the Waste Treatment Plant, which is at Hanford in Washington. 
um, the waste treatment plant is supposed to vitrify nuclear waste, which means it will, they're going to pump waste out of all of the high-level radioactive waste uh, drums or uh, tanks, rather, that are buried <coughs> underground at Hanford, which is in Washington. Hanford is the site that, uh, where there were reactors that created most of the plutonium for our nuclear weapons stockpile. It's the most contaminated site in the Western Hemisphere. They have millions and millions of gallons of nuclear waste in tanks that were built in the 50s and 60s that were supposed to have a 20-year lifespan and that are buried in the ground and leaking, uh, majorly leaking into the ground. And the site is right on the Columbia River in eastern Washington. Um, it's a major environmental problem, so we're um, actively cleaning it up on about a 100-year cycle, which is going to cost an estimated $180 billion. But, uh, in the meantime, we're trying to pump some out into this new facility that we're building at the cost of $13 billion called the Waste Treatment Plant. The Waste Treatment Plant will turn this uh, liquid waste into glass, vitrify it, and then that can be more safely disposed of. Liquid waste is much more difficult to deal with than um, a solid waste would be. It's a good thing that we're building this plant. Um, Bechtel Corporation, which is headquartered here in San Francisco, is the corporation that has been contracted to build it. Um, and they have been found to be cutting corners. Uh, big surprise. And some of the ways they were cutting corners started to alarm workers. Um, a engineer who worked for Bechtel for 30 years, a top level engineer, looked at what they were doing, looked at some of the design changes they were making after the designs had been approved, and said, this is putting the facility at risk of hydrogen explosions. And you don't want to have hydrogen explosions somewhere where we're pumping in high level radioactive waste. They said, well, thank you, Walter, very much for letting us know that. The next day, he came into work, and they said, you have a new office. It's down in the basement where the printers are, and there's no telephone, and you no longer are working on this project. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't really understand, and he sat there for four months. And it wasn't until one day when his wife called him on his cell phone, because again, he had no telephone in his station, and said, I just heard that they, can't, they stopped work on the project. He said, what are you talking about? I'm in my office. And he walked out, and everybody was gone, and nobody had even thought to tell him that they had stopped work. So that was the final straw. He realized that this company he had been so loyal to for 30 years uh, had abandoned him because he brought these issues out. There's a group like Tri-Valley Cares in Hanford called Hanford Challenge. He went to Hanford Challenge and brought successful litigation about this um, and was reinstated to his job, and they went back and changed the design back to the original design. So it's a success story, but the only one that uh, came at you know, much personal expense to this gentleman, and uh, one that brings us just to the point where as we should all be very aware and alarmed that these kind of situations take place. Luckily, he was a very brave person and was able to stand up to this kind of isolation from a big company, but um, that can be a, a very tough, tough thing. Um, I have a worker right now who came down with kidney cancer in a building at Livermore Lab, and she um, asked to be moved, and they did move her out of her office. They moved someone else into the office. Three months later, he left on medical leave. She doesn't know why. Um, she was, was ashamed about her kidney cancer. She thought it was something you know, that was personal that she had done that got her to have kidney cancer. Um, and then at a party, she was talking to another gentleman, and she said, you know, they were casually talking, and he mentioned he had just had his kidney removed, and they worked in the same building. Fifteen of them work in this machine shop. She said, whoa, I had my kidney removed because I had kidney cancer. And he said, wow, I had kidney cancer too. That makes five of us. And so they are now trying to get more attention, and I'm trying to help them to get more attention to the fact that people are working in a site that is giving them kidney problems or kidney cancer. Another person in there has pancreatic cancer, but um, same systems. So um, I, I bring these up, especially her case. She still works at the lab, all those people do, because this is an ongoing thing. There's an kind of an idea in the Department of Energy that there's legacy contamination and there's um, people used to get sick, but now we've taken care of those problems and people no longer get sick, and that's really not true. Um, these people are, are still getting sick, and maybe it is because of legacy contamination, but they're still actively working with toxic chemicals and radioactive materials, and people can still get sick from those things. Um, one positive thing is that there is an act called the 
um, National Defense Authorization Act. Horrible act. Ooh, it does terrible yeah. things. Yeah. Terrible things. There happens to be one provision in NDAA that is remarkably good for whistleblowers. It says that um, people who work at contractors for the federal government are eligible to to uh, bring whistleblower actions under as a federal employee, rather than being tied to just being a private em employee. Um, so it's made it a lot easier for whistleblowers at places like Department of Energy, National Nuclear Security Administration sites like Livermore that are managed by private contractors to bring a whistleblower action as a federal employee. They have, it's just a better act. The Federal Employees Whistleblower Protection Act is a better act than what you would get as a private employee. Um, it's not great, but it's better. Um, there's lots of other acts, environmental laws mainly, that provide for whistleblower protections, but still generally they have a short statute of limitations. They require that you've been retaliated against in some way, and that can be really hard to prove. For example, Walter, the man in Hanford, he was just isolated. They didn't fire him. Um, they just tried to make him leave. Um, and that can be, a pr it can be pretty difficult to show that in court as retaliation, that putting him in a room by himself was really them retaliating. That you can, he was able to do it. The court felt that his isolation was retaliation. But um, a lot of workers kind of throw up their hands and say, well, I, I tried to blow the whistle, I, I brought a safety and health issue to the attention of the powers that be in the facility, and nothing was done, and they didn't do anything to me either. They didn't um, fire me, they didn't move me, um, and truthfully, then you don't have a legitimate whistleblower claim. You have to have been retaliated against under these laws. So, so that can be a, a hard burden of proof and um, be a deterrent to blowing the whistle. They have the option when there's an organization like Tri Valley Cares to relay the information to us, and then we can independently try to go and do something, which is kind of why organizations like ours that are in the community are important. But uh, there, we don't exist in all all communities. Uh, so what I've told most of the story.